Hello and welcome to another edition of Your Off Say Media with me, Kathleen Ritorne. We're an organisation that aims to connect people in conservation by holding interviews on social media. Today, I am very happy. I am joined by Tim Harrison from Outreach for Animals. Before we go into the questions, I'm going to just show a quick video about the recent documentary that he's been working on. So watch the space. New hit, Captivating America. Tiger King is the number one show in the U.S. again this week. The series took the country by storm earlier this year, and people are now binge-watching this new series. More than nine Americans have seen the docu-series about Big Cat. Joe Exotic will now serve 22 years in prison after a jury I'm a retired cop. What I'm trying to do is figure out what happens as cats were used as ambassador animals. If somebody were to try to track down an animal that they saw on a late night show, I wouldn't bet more than a nickel that they'd be able to find one of them. We have this network of individuals who are using big cats, and there's no meaningful mechanism by which we can figure out where they're going. It's dumbfounding that we have to go to this extent to find endangered species in the United States of America. If you can't find them, that doesn't mean that they're disappearing. It means you need to learn how to find them better. People think that he's representing this whole industry of conservation, and that's just not the truth. Well, we're in a tug of war right now. There's, every time we start pulling, the other side starts pulling a little of that back. When you got the people like us crazies like that out there, gonna hire somebody to kill her, he said, this is what I'm gonna do to her. I'm gonna cap her ass. Pow! We've been knocked down, we've been lied to, and let me tell you something right now, the battle's on. Go! They're supposed to be ambassadors for the endangered species out there. <laughs> Who's looking out for them? How are you filming? I mean, Tim, that gives me goosebumps every time I, I, I look at it. Um, but before we get into that kind of conversation, if we could start off a little bit talking about yourself and your background um, and how you went into becoming a wildlife advocate and how this fits in also with your role as an ex-police officer. Yeah, so Alex, real quick, I'm wearing my shirt right here. Challenge accepted from the conservation game. That's bears, et cetera and the Big Cat uh, uh, Alliance, Sanctuary Alliance, all sponsored that. But it was one of those situations where that's my favorite quote from Jeff Kramer in that movie, as you saw it, uh, challenge accepted, because this was a challenge. Now, how I got started was I worked for a, uh, I was basically a zoo vet in Ohio when I was 16 years old. I needed a job, I started walking dogs, I went around with him, he took me around as his little protege, and we would go and we'd work on uh, animals at different zoos here locally in the state of Ohio. Uh, got to a point where um, we were only getting four or five calls a year, maybe python in the backyard, bear chained up at somebody's farm. You know, man, that's about the way it worked. Then all of a sudden, he gets married. I got a high school sweetheart out in Colorado leaves me there. The local police department still keep calling me over the years to come and you know and catch these animals or find them place someplace to go because you know nobody knew what to do back then. That's the seventies. That's seventy three all the way up to uh, into until I did the first documentary. Uh, the elephant in the living room. So we did. I was out catching these animals, re, trying to relocate them, finding places for them, developing my own place for a period of time, helped with the development of a reptile uh, uh, facility, to rescue facility. And we just kind of kept these animals after a while. But it was just continuing on and on and on and on. It was from the School of Hard Knocks, what I learned for from, and a few people from different zoological zookeepers, but they didn't run into these animals in people's basements. They ran. They worked with them in a cage. I was running into tigers in people's backyards or bear in this corn crib. I have to explain what a corn crib is. I was in New York here recently. A corn crib is where a round circle, about 20 foot by 20 foot, they pile corn into. It's a fenced in area with a tin roof. That's where your, your tiger goes. Everybody wants a tiger cub, but nobody wants a tiger. They end up dumping them inside these horrible cement flat areas, and that's where I usually find them, or they escape. 
Um, which we found that happened in the Everglades, as you saw in the, uh, the elephant in the living room, when people started dumping their pythons off, no place to go. And I think that's the problem, isn't it? That everyone wants them when they're babies, but they don't want them when they're grown up and they're more dangerous. Um, so you're the founder of Outreach for Animals. Can you tell us a little bit about your organization and how it was founded and what it stands for? Yes, we, it was actually started by myself and another police officer, firefighter paramedic, by the name of Russ Muntz. I was busy doing all of these rescues. He kept watching me do this. We worked together as police officers, firefighters, paramedics. And he says, Tim, you need a nonprofit or something to help you. You're all coming out of your own pocket, which it still basically does right now, too. But it's when you have everybody knows it has a nonprofit. But it's one of those situations where we stepped up. We had to start it. It started with police officers, firefighters, paramedics, and animal control. Then we started blossoming over the years into veterinarians, emergency room doctors, pediatric physicians, because they're the ones running into the injuries from these pets in people's homes. And then it blossomed into, you know, more into lawyers and more into college professors. We've got teams from Harvard. We've got teams all over the country right now working with us. And that's how we got started to teach proper behavior around wildlife, because it's sure as hell not being taught on TV. Too much of the wrestling and wrestling and back, really upsetting an animal so it attacks you. I want to teach people to be uh, not obnoxious outsiders in the environment, but be part of the environment, which is not being taught. When somebody goes crashing through the woods going, danger, 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 smashing through everything, diving on something's back, upsetting it so bad it attacks them, <laughs> to me, that's not conservation. That's exploitation, and that's an animal pimp. And as I start, understand it, I was doing a bit of research on you. And um, for you, it was when you went on a trip on a safari and you saw wildlife in their natural environment that kind of changed your outlook. Can you talk a little bit about this? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I had a lot of different things happen over the years. I have not, there's not one animal I haven't run into. I mean, everything from an orangutan in a bar to a giraffe in somebody's garage with atrophy of the neck had been in there over a year. So I went to Africa. I was invited to go with a zoological park to be part of their security and their paramedic just in case somebody got hurt. So I got a lot of free trips over my life. And I got to go over there. And as I was sitting in the Jeep, the thing that got me, I get a little emotional. The thing that got me was the giraffes running past us. And it's funny you call it what your show's called, a giraffe. It's one of the things that drew me to you. The giraffe runs by. The giraffes run by. This is not the giraffes I ran into in people's backyards or in people's garages. These are beautiful creatures. They're battling each other with their necks. They're, you know, they're running with their little manes going. And it's like, man, this is this is the way it should be. But then I ran into some lions with, the, with one of the guides. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, I never want to see a lion in a cage again. This ain't fair. This ain't right. Now, I'm not against AZA zoos. Uh, they're stepping up now and trying to do the right thing because of our documentary. They said the conservation game was all true. They're stepping up to change what they're doing, which I appreciate them for doing that. But I am, I'm not happy with animals in cages. Now, I 100% agree with you. And that kind of feeds nicely into my, my next question, which is one of the first documentaries that you did was The Elephant in the Living Room. Can you talk to us a little about this and what it involved and, and the work that went behind the scenes here? Yes, yeah, so it's kind of unusual because Mike Weber is a, he, he actually does motion pictures for Lionsgate, a, a movie director, movie producer. And he read my first two books and he, and he was on his way to Poland to a horror movie. And somebody had given them those books. Uh, a friend of mine that I worked for, did security work for, for uh, entertainment and artists, he gave the books to him. He read them on the way over. And all of a sudden I get this call like at three in the morning from this, from this guy saying he wants to do his first documentary with me. I've already given up on TV. I was on the dark side. I was on Animal Planet. I did all the shows, as you saw in the Elephant or in the Conservation Game, where, uh, you know, take your shirt off, wrestle a gator. That's the style of Animal Planet. That's Disney. That's Discovery. That's their style. So I, I couldn't do it. I backed out, could not do this. And so when he, he approached me with this, I've already done TV shows already. I've already been involved with this. I was on the national TV, the Daily Buzz for two years, the most popular segment they had on. And I just said, I can't do this anymore. I just don't feel right doing it. He talked me into it. He's a charmer. And thank God he did. Thank God. Because when he went out road with me for six months, that's it, six months. He filmed just for six months. And it was my slow time. 
We ran into elephant in somebody's garage in Macy, Indiana. We ran into tie a lions loose on the interstates chasing cars and pike, piked in Ohio. It, it was a, a madhouse. For him, it was a madhouse. To me, it's just a regular year. So he took that footage, went to the uh, Silver Springs uh, International Film Festival, made a little documentary, played it there, won, got the ACE Award, got the money needed to finish the documentary. That's how it was made. And it was hard work. It was a year and eight months of my life and what I do, and a year and eight months of Terry Brumfield, God bless his soul, that great guy. He's going to teach me it's okay to have lions in my backyard, even though his lions escaped and attacked cars on the interstate. He's going to show me it was all right, and we came together. It's it's quite the film. It won the Genesis Award from uh, uh, the HSUS and some of the other organizations, which we're very proud of. That's To me, that means more than the Oscar. <laughs> And so for people who are watching that aren't based in America, I mean, I'm, I'm from England um, and we do have exotic pets, but probably not to the extent that the U.S. does. Um, so what is the what is the situation there? I mean, as I understand it, sometimes it's easier to get hold of a, a, a tiger than it is than a, a pedigree uh, dog. Oh, absolutely. And I, I've been out with different teams. I've had TV shows uh, from Australia to TV Tokyo. I'll come over here and they're stunned. I tell them, I said, let's go down the road here to this little auction or let's go down the road to this little area over here where these people are having an outdoor get together and I can get you a tiger cub for almost free because it's been declawed, it's been surgically altered. Nobody wants it anymore and it's not eating. You can get anything you want. And that's the sad part here in the United States of America because we have liberties. We have the right to do whatever we want. The problem is, is when you cross that rights with other human beings, public safety, because I'm, that's what my, my specialty is, public safety. My friends and, and my, my partners out at uh, Texas A&M at Disaster City, Disaster City has nothing to do with what I do, but they I teach out there as an uh, in, instructor, uh, adjunct instructor, and I get to deal with officers, police officers, fire chiefs, governors, mayors, people from all over the country coming in, and they all have stories because it was getting out of control. Whatever you saw on TV, monkey see, monkey do, will be immediately for sale on these auctions or on the internet, or used to be in the uh, 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 advertisements in newspapers. You can get anything you want. And I used to follow that. All of a sudden, the Gaboon Viper was on uh, an Animal Planet show. I would tell people at local TV shows, we're gonna have Gaboon Vipers in our area within the next month. And people all tell me you're crazy. You go to the auctions and there they are. And it's that quick. Remember 101 Dalmatians? Every time it's shown, everybody races out and gets himself a Dalmatian pup. And within a couple of months, their hypers all get out. They dump them back in local humane societies. Just ask them. Finding Nemo. The whole movie is a great movie. Don't put me in an aquarium. So what happens in the United States of America? $13.5 billion a year industry putting a clownfish in children's aquariums because daddy and mommy wanted to buy it. Monkey see, monkey do. Yeah. And also what I think... For me personally, it's difficult to get my head around is the fact that uh, the authorities aren't even aware where these animals are. So with you, when you're working as a first responder, um, if you're going into properties, you don't know what you're walking into. And so how do you do work with this? Yeah, we're trying to train as many people as possible. I got to help with a lot of conferences and I go to speak and kind of open people's minds up in law enforcement, first responders. We actually did uh, a, a lot of groups that go in and do child trafficking because there is a connection with these people, you know, like the Joe Exotics and the Doc Antles and all these people. They all have some kind of thing going on out there. So we have a, a tendency to connect the dots with everything. So these guys are telling me stories. That's what I, I you know, I go to these uh, these uh, conferences and all of a sudden, it's, and they're telling me, hey, Tim, I, I we had four tiger cubs. Perfect examples in, in Texas, McClellan, Texas, six tiger cubs for sale in a van. Bunch of people surrounded her van at a, a Walmart parking lot. All of a sudden, everybody, everybody pulls in the police, thought it was a drug deal. Turns out it was six tiger cubs she was selling out. And guess what? They confiscated him, took him to the local zoo there in Texas. The, the, uh, the uh, attorney for the state of Texas said she'll never get him back. The prosecutor, literally, she'll never get him back. I get on TV, she's getting him back. And everybody's going, you're crazy, Tim. Six weeks, she got her cats back because there was no legislation against it. What did that sheriff tell you? With the lions loose on the uh, and the elephant in the living room. <laughs> you got to have tags. You got to have a license for a dog. You ain't got nothing for a lion. Yeah. No. 
That's what America is about right now. We got to stop that. In China right now, as you know, what they talk about with the uh, the tigers and stuff, you heard about what happened at CITES here within the last year or two, where they said, hey, we, we're not listening to you, America. You're worse than we are. You got the Tiger King. You got more tigers in people's private hands than we have that we're even using for medicines. So we have to clean our act up. And that's what the Big Cat Public Safety Act's about. That's what I helped to, to develop that years ago. But it's also what I'm pushing for right now with Big Cat Rescue. Get on Big Cat Rescue site and they'll tell you how to contact your senator and Congress people. So the big uh, the, the the safety act that you're trying to put in place, for those who are not sure, can you explain a little bit about, more about what that is and then how that will actually help? Yeah, it's it's a national law, not just locally. I've been I've been to the cities, I've been to states, and got state and local laws. But you know, a tiger doesn't know that he's going from Ohio to Indiana. He doesn't stop and say, "Oh, it's illegal there, but I can't go across the state line." So the magical part about this is we need a national law to stop the breeding, and that's what this is about: the independent breeding, the independent people that are doing pay for play, taking these cubs to fairs, to malls to get their pictures taken with people, making millions and literally millions of dollars, which has been exposed now. And people are sitting there going, whoa, 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 I'm getting my picture taken because it's conservation, right? So they tell you it's conservation. Not one tiger has ever been released that's been bred in captivity or interbred, they're not pure, loose in India or Nepal. I've been over there for the tiger projects. And you ask them over there, can I bring a tiger that I rescued, which I've rescued hundreds? No, you ain't bringing that over here. You can't even put it on a plane and take it over there. And I think that's the thing, right? A lot of people do the spin where they're saying, oh, we're doing conservation, we're breeding these animals, they're going to be released back in the wild. They can never be released. They've been hand-reared, so that's never going to be a possibility. And they're also the genetics are not going to, um, going to match up, right? So what can people do back home to, to try and stop this from happening? Well, the main reason is, is to, to actually get a book actually watch that's why i'm so happy with these documentaries these documentaries done more than all the, me speaking on any tv show or doing anything it's the documentaries have, have awakened the, the world and you know i have a quote that i, I want to say right now and i'll say it at the end too what these animal exploiters these animal pimps fear the most is an educated public yeah. once they're educated they're gonna know whoa my niece did a beautiful job. This is a perfect example of what any of you can do right now. If you run into a person, hey, put the tiger on your lap, get your picture taken at the mall, fair, anywhere, right? Somebody's birthday party, boom. This is what you do. She went up. I was kind of embarrassed at first because I was there with a local news person undercover. He goes, there goes your niece. I said, oh, my, what's she going to get in line for? She went up and sat down, massive crowd of people, massive. I mean, unbelievable. So she sits down, they put the tiger cub on her lap. She reaches up, grabs the paws like Uncle Tim's daughter, and she squeezes it and she goes, where is it? Where's this tiger's claws? Yells it to the crowd. Where is its claws? He can't defend himself. What did you do to this animal? You, what did you? And the people were like getting mad now. And the guy's trying to take, it was a Russian gentleman. He's trying to take the tiger cub away from her and she wouldn't do it. She stood up and she goes, this animal has been surgically altered. There's something wrong with this animal. What did they do to it so we can get our pictures taken? She took half that crowd, at least, away with her. Nice. That's that, right. Yeah. yeah, no, that and that's exactly that. I mean, we, we touched on it at the start when we was, um, I showed the trailer to the conservation game. Um, can you discuss what an animal ambassador is and the myth that breeding these animals in captivity is supportive for conservation? Yes, an animal ambassador, everybody knows what they are but they don't know why they're called that. They think, oh, I am an ambassador. They're gonna go back and have the most beautiful life ever. They're gonna go back to an AZA accredited zoo, which they do, most of them do a very good job. They wanna take them back, you know, treat them like VIPs. They're an ambassador, right? Come on. Well, an animal ambassador is a term that they use for any animal they can take out into public, like on TV, we call it the TV circuit, hit all the TV shows, Jimmy Kimmel, all the clown acts, where they take them around and hand them off to, other uh, uh, individuals on the show, entertainers. Can you imagine taking a, a neonatal, as you saw in the in, in our film, the conservation game, a neonatal snow leopard, only like a hundred or so left in the wild, endangered species, and pass it around to all these with people screaming in a crowd and bright lights. Anybody that sees that and doesn't see there's something wrong with that has been polluted 
by the TV shows we've been watching on Animal Planet. And I too, do say polluted. Because if you take them separately and you ask that same person, why do you like that guy that six guys jump on the back of the croc for no reason? Well, it's uh, it's good education. Education for what? What is it? Why are you wanting an animal to attack you? I have been 47 years doing this and I've never been mauled. Every animal on the planet, because we actually respect the animals. When respect was taken away and when it turns into entertainment and exploitation, people have a tendency to fall for that, the barker at the, at the fair. Do, 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 do. It's no different. Circus act. Do, 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 do. And they're going to tell you what you're seeing is okay. And this is why we're going to help those cats. And like I said before, there is no way in, in God's green earth that a tiger that's going to that's going to be raised in somebody's backyard, or and that's what the majority of these animals are raised in people's backyard. They're like they're like puppy mills. We just broke up two this year, or this yeah. yeah beginning of last year. So it was one of those situations where you know people don't realize it, but they're just overbreeding because you have to have cubs, and they're thinking these cubs are going to go as ambassador animals representing the animals in the wild. Well, I can tell you right now, if you want to see a tiger, go to Nepal. Do an eco tourist. I mean, by eco tourist situation, don't ride on the back of an elephant. Please leave those elephants alone. Uh, try to go and, and be with people that are doing research. Volunteer your time, even if it's writing data down. Enjoy your life. Learn. Don't go there as just some uh, ugly American or ugly uh, European. Just go, go and do something, and you're going to appreciate it a lot more. Volunteer your service. And you're going to be amazed. That's one thing I real quick. I was doing the circuit, the college circuit. A gentleman from Nepal was doing the circuit with me. He didn't even know there was, he was a researcher and everything from Nepal. Never met him before. He said that uh, he was listening to my, he says, no, there's Tim, there's no way people have tigers in their homes. No, no way. No way in the United States. So I did my program and he got tears in his eyes. So he even told us at the end of the program, he had a big organization that collects a lot of money. So you can get a little stuffed animal and a little profile of your tiger that you're, you're adopting bull, you know. He ends up standing in front of the people that brought him there and goes, uh, I don't need your money anymore. We're not getting it because I need your bodies to all the college students. I need you to come over and help us build corridors, make corridors so these cats can move from one area to the other without being killed and out hurting and inter 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 interacting with human beings. That's what he needed. And I loved it. I loved it because reality sucks at times. But then when people find out they've been lied to, like with the Shamus and the Orcas, what happened? Bam, right? When they see the conservation game, we had packs of people, protesters coming in. They're going to tear me apart. And they're going to tear Jeff Kramer and Mike Weber and all of us apart. You know, you don't understand. You're a know-it-all. You know all these things. And they sit there after it's over with, they're giving me their cards. We're part of you, brother. We're part of you. And I think that's one of, it's kind of one of the most depressing things with what's happening is that people are thinking that they're actually doing a good thing by going to these attractions and supporting because they're like, okay, this tiger's or this lion is going to have a lovely little life. And then the reality is somewhat very darker. And I recommend everyone to go and watch the conservation game. It's, um, it's hard watching, but it's important. Um, and then also on the other side of it, you have people that genuinely do love these animals as their pets, pets. Um, but obviously this environment is absolutely not suitable for them. So how do you then stop this from happening? How do you educate people to one, not to go to these attractions and two, yes, you may love this animal, but you shouldn't have it as a pet. Well, I start off with a philosophy called you're loving these animals to death. Yeah. And then we start from that. Oh, Tim, just like in the elephant in the living room. Ah, oh, Tim, you, Terry. Ah, oh, Tim, you know, you're crazy. I love these animals. you got to remember, I came from that environment. Yeah. I used to catch those animals. I had no place for them, so I made my own place. Yeah. I helped with some other people, got together and made our own place. I used to sleep with tigers. I used to run with wolves. I did all that stuff. And then I, what turned me around I did a show, a daily buzz show, which I love to death. It was we educated a lot of people. I was the first one to actually show people washing their hands on TV after handing a reptile. I was the first one in the United States because nobody ever wanted to see it. Like Steve Irwin's people told me when I was at his place over there, nobody wants to see that, Tim. That's boring. No, that's called lack, don't kill kids, salmonella. So it ends up where people come in. I took a tiger that I just got off the streets of Dayton, Ohio, walking down the street. It was probably about seven months old, six months old. So I brought it on, no surgical altar. It was walking right down the streets a day. We didn't even know who owned it. 
could have been a sickle gang, could have been anybody, and it just, or it could have been a private owner, just walking down the street. They were going to shoot it. And police officers do not want to shoot these animals. Trust me. I was there at Zanesville, post-traumatic syndrome. We don't want to go through that again. So it ends up walking down, take the cat on TV, try to educate. People brought their kids in, the cameraman, everybody brought their kids in. As soon as it was over, everybody wanted to get a picture with the tiger. And as I was asking the kids, my partner Russ and I, and I'm asking the kids, and I had big, I had my jungle hat on and my clothes and everything else, thought I was educating because I was trying to be, I, I wanted to be like Jack Hanna, basically. I wanted to teach people through, you know, what I thought was the only way to do it. And I asked the kids, hey, where do these tigers come from? Nobody knew, but everybody wanted one. Parents were talking about, hey, how long can I keep this before I'd have to get rid of it if I got a cub? And I'm sitting, I'm shocked. Nobody listened to a word I said on TV, not a word. But they could complain about the color of my shirt didn't match my eyes. They couldn't complain. They complained about other things, but they did not complain that that tiger was walking down the street today. Didn't hear me at all. Russ and I left that morning. And from that point on, we had tons of sponsors, all kinds of donations. We had all kinds of stuff at that time. Had our own vehicle donated to us. Everybody stopped. As soon as I stopped taking animals on TV, as soon as I stopped doing entertainment, we lost everything, zero. And that made us proud because we knew we were doing the right thing. <laughs> Being police officers, we knew it because police officers are always the first ones on the scene when one of these <laughs> animals escape. They're the ones that have to take care of it and they're not trained for that. And that's what we're trying to help them out. But they shouldn't have to be trained for this. They shouldn't have to be trained. Just remember, I, I always tell people, you know, it's you can buy a Cobra, but you can't buy common sense. So when you get into these situations, these law enforcement officers can go into somebody's home. They have no idea, like you said, what they're opening the door to. It could be a tiger behind there, a bear or a large python. Nobody knows. And there's so many of them. So kind of feeding on a little bit from that. So a lot of what you're talking about, and we had a question coming through from um, Leslie that kind of fed in a little bit to that. Um, so people, monkey see, monkey do are watching the um, programs, they're watching the films, they're watching these big shows where these animals are getting dragged in and in, in, in terrifying environments for them. Um, is there a way to stop these shows? Because the problem is, is they're popular, right? So everyone loves to see a tiger cub, everyone loves to see a little lion. Um, and as Leslie was saying in this comment here, there's a movie coming out with a Malamu dog, which is a, very intelligent but also you need to have the right skills to manage this animal but people see it they want it how do we stop that we're not going to be able to directly stop it what we need to do is pass legislation that sometimes protect the animals and the people i have learned over my years as a law enforcement individual i'm going to round it off about 80 percent of the population will do what the law says and there's about, oh, about 18% that are, hee-haw, maybe, I don't know, I don't know. There's 2% will just be bad. There's nothing you can do about that. So I'll take that 80%. We got right now, we got 90% of people that want to get their pictures taken with a tiger. Now you go, this is what the crazy part of it is, you'll go into Nepal, you'll go with the Taru. I've been there with them anytime we're sitting there. My partners and I are sitting there. I said, hey, so do you guys want to get your picture taken with a uh, with tiger? No, kids. No way. Why would you? Who would want to do that? Stop and think about that for a second. How did we go from respect and looking at, at the largest predatory cat in the world, the most per perfect killing machine, as National Geographic calls it, into something to put in a magic act? Think about that for a minute. How yeah. did we develop that way? It's not going to it's going to take years to develop that get, to get away from that. But I'm surprised. Blackfish, the cove, you know, the elephant in the living room. All these things, you know, just pop up and you're going to be, we got millions of people that see through this now, which it used to be. I don't know how old you are, Kathleen, you look very young, but I, I'm <laughs> five years old. And I could tell you right now, I just, I was on, a, I've been on a ton of podcasts. I was on a top podcast earlier this year and I said, I, I had tears in my eyes. I never thought my wildest dreams that R R uh, Ringling's Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus would close. You know, think about that for a minute. These are major accomplishments, right? Yeah. And uh, with this new documentary, The Conservation Game, look what we did to the AZA. We cleaned it up for them, helped them. 
And we also are trying to change people's minds. Once it gets out, which it is soon, it is soon going to hit. And it's coming to you, coming to the UK. It's coming everywhere. It's coming to South America. It's coming all the way. You know, it's in Australia doing very well right now. It's going all around Denmark. Uh, it's going everywhere. Uh, it's going to be coming. And when people get a chance to see it, pass on the word. Uh, like I said, I don't get paid a cent to do this. And they're not making money. All, it's not Nobody's making a big bond of money off a documentary, as we all know. This is made strictly to get the Big Cat Public Safety Act through and to teach people what you're talking about. This film has already educated educators already. Once we get the educators educated, the ones that show push in Steve Irwin or, uh, you know, Doc Antle videos of him playing with chimpanzees as educational tools in elementary schools. Once we stop that and start looking at it and go, hmm, you know, by the way, you know, why don't we just leave them alone? Yeah. Why do we have to jump on them? I, the first time I'm going to say a large production group came here, I have, I have a ton of ton of people wanting me to do a series. And I, I, I sat down. I was really serious thinking about doing it because I thought this is the way to do it. But then I thought, hey, I pulled that with Jack Hanna, didn't I? I thought taking animals on TV was a way to go, too. And the first thing out of my mouth, I asked, and this is the main headquarters in Silver Springs, uh, Maryland. I'm sitting there and they're all going through this. Tell me we're going to make you famous, which I could care less. And, blah, 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 blah. and I'm sitting there. And as soon as I got done, I said, hey, do you have anything on your station? This is, oh, my God, look, it's a cobra. Let's leave it alone. Right? No. Let's watch what it does. Right? No. It's, it's got to grab it, spin it, upset yeah. it. A cobra goes up like this. He's not happy. All right? So, and he's also telling you, back off. I'm a cobra. Rattlesnake. I'm a rattlesnake. Are you an idiot? Back off. So I'm teaching children and other people out there. If you see a show where some snake is rattling his tail, that means somebody's teasing it, bothering yeah. it. And I know you've seen the snakes striking TV cameras. I'm really big on reptiles, too, because they're the most abused in the world. Striking TV cameras as hard as they can with their faces. If you go to any zoo in the world, what's it tell you? Don't tap on the glass. Because all they got is the heat sensors, Jacobs and more heat sensors in their face. They smack that glass. They're going to die a horrible death. And, you know, they can't yell out and say, ow, if you did that to a chimpanzee, people be all upset. Ah, they'd be going crazy. A snake striking a TV camera, he can't say ow. So you can do that to him. But the whole thing is you start with the reptiles and you work your way up. Cruelty starts with you stepping on something all the way up to uh, killing an elephant for a trophy. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. You know, mammals um, well, get a lot of positive press, right, because they're cute and they look similar to us. They have the big eyes, blah, blah, blah. And then the reptiles, people seem to kind of de- humanizes the wrong word but they don't see them as a living thing they see it as like oh well that's okay it's a it's a reptile or it's a fish or because mm -hmm. it's a little bit away from who we are yeah, um yeah, and then you yeah, have the issues yeah. yeah you're right so you have the issues of then trying to kind of get people to be aware to look after and protect them um we have a question coming through from winnie hi winnie always absolutely lovely to see you and she's asking, are school children in the U.S. schools taught about how wrong it is to have a wild animal? Good question. So, uh, Wendy, thank you on that one, because no, there is isolated cases where teachers are saying, you know, don't bring a raccoon in your home. But it's very rare because I'm telling you, a lot of the look at the books, look at the kids books. It's stunning. My wife took me in to show me some kid, new kids books coming out. I'm like, oh, you know, you know it's, raise Puffy in your home. Puffy does. Puffy's my buddy. We take a bath together. And it's a raccoon, right? Or it's a koala, a koala, or it's, you know, something I'm going, whoa, 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 please, please. That's disrespecting the animal. And that's not what the animal wants. No animal wants to be in a bathtub with a kid. It's one of those situations where people don't realize that you have just signed a death warrant, a death wish for that animal. Once you play with a wild animal, once you feed that squirrel in your backyard by hand, I'm all for feeding them. Okay. Just don't overdo it. Don't make them fat squirrels. Right. But the thing is, is that don't feed them by hand because you're just sitting at the park, take it from a police officer, firefighter, paramedic. I lost count how many times I've been called out. Hey, a raccoon, he's got distemper or he's got rabies. He just come right up to us. And he went, no, it's somebody's pet. Yeah. You got to lose. Can you imagine with a grizzly bear? If people raise them like you see on the show, the guy's got the grizzly bear, he's wrestled it. And I said, we're turning it loose. Oh, hell you are. You ain't turning it loose in any place I want to be turned loose. Because that poor thing has now got himself a death warrant because he cannot ever be turned loose again. 
he is yeah. going to be in captivity for the rest of his life. Just remember that. People just, I like to say common sense, but common sense isn't that common anymore. So what I like to say is this. Pick up a book, look at a show, get all the information, sit back for a second, take a deep breath, look at your dog, look at your cat. You want a cat 500 pounds in your house? How does your cat act? I love cats. <laughs> But, buddy, I don't want some of those cats to be 500 pounds. And that's the same <laughs> with your dog, right? Look at your dog. Your dog has just got the taste of a wolf in it. Imagine a real wolf. I had many incidences where people called my wolf went crazy, chased a cockroach under a floorboard, ripped the whole wall down to get that cockroach. The dog usually doesn't do that. We have a question coming through from Emma. Hi, Emma. Lovely to see you. And she is saying, how big is the risk that the new legislations will push this underground and how will it be policed? Yeah, the one thing about the, uh, I, I, that's a beautiful question, Since especially since I was at Zanesville, the Zanesville Massacre. A lot of you don't know what that is. A, a gentleman turned 56 of the most dangerous creatures, 38 big cats, grizzly bears, I mean, loose on the city of Zanesville. And they had to shoot and kill 49 of them. And then nobody's ever been the same after that. We had to respond to that. Six were saved, but it was just a, a sad situation all around. Now, pushing it underground, there's always going to be underground. But you've got to understand, too, there's always going to be bad guys, like I said before. Now, how is it going to be policed? It's real simple. What would have happened at Zanesville? That's what, what's the sheriff, Lutz, say. He's got interviews all the time saying, if we had legislation, this would never have happened. We'd have got those animals off of there that we never would have had that situation occur. We had legislation in Ohio. We had a executive order. It was dropped by Governor Kasich. And just months later, uh, he turned his animals loose. So legislation is the way to go. So a police officer, if he goes into a home, and we have this in cities now in some states where I've helped put legislation, they see a cougar in a cage. We can rescue that cougar now. They see a cobra. I just picked up some paperwork today on some uh, 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 rhino vipers that we had rescued years ago, all from one police officer. Guy was breeding them in his home in a suburban area, Rhino Viper. Same one that killed my partner, uh, Michael Peterman, the Dayton firefighter. And this may be a silly question, but why are the legislations not there in the first place? Is it purely because they're trying to appease the political, uh, their, their voters and they're wanting to be popular? Yeah, there's a lot of lying. As you can see, there's a lot of lying in this world. If you look at Doc Antle, you look at Joe Exotics. Think about the FRC. Tiger King, he's a superhero now. The guy slaughtered endangered species, made money off of it, and people made a hero out of him. I even said that before that show came out, because you can hear my voice in the first show. I was supposed to be a part of that, and I backed out of it immediately because it's. I didn't feel like to feel this is a Kardashian, this is a reality show garbage feel. And I'm like, I stepped away from it. People have a tendency to blindly follow the jiggling keys, whatever's pretty at the time or whatever they're told at the time. So yeah, uh, the, the, this legislation should have been in years ago. And you're going to see, if you watch the history of Outreach for Animals, my organization, you'll see we started years ago in you know, Dayton, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, moved our way up to major cities. People had the crazy stuff back then because of reality TV starting. But people didn't realize how bad it was. And they also say it's big business. It is a big business. When they lay down their, their paperwork, $16 billion a year, whatever it is for dangerous exotic animals a year. And if people see that, states think they're getting that. And then when Uncle Tim comes in and Uncle Russ and we say, oh, oh here's the real thing. What did you get from it? Yeah. Oh, we didn't get anything. That's why I plugged in the public safety part of that years ago with Tippy Hedren. We plugged it in and said, hey, nobody gives a crap about the cats. Senators don't, Congress people don't, they don't care. They care about public safety and the first responders. And we're the ones risking our lives as first responders every day when something like this happens. So that's what caught people's eyes. And it's true. It's true. There's no arguing over that. People say, oh, no, it doesn't happen. Bang, bang, bang. I just start throwing stories down. I start getting police reports. You can't argue with a police report. Yeah, and I think, again, going back to the conservation game, uh, when I watched it, you can see some of these stories and, and how they transfold. Um, kind of touching a little bit on that as well. So obviously, I 100% back what you're doing and think what you're doing is incredible work. But there's going to be people that are not going to want you to be doing this because it's, they're going to be losing money or they can't keep their little cute tiger or whatever it is, right? 
Um, have you ever been frightened in what you're doing and like scared for pushing for the wildlife? Actually, to tell you the truth, I have more, I'm more nervous around the animal people, the bad guys, the animal exploiters, the pimps, animal yeah. pimps, I call them because a law enforcement officer, that's what they are. They're animal pimps. And I'm a little bit more nervous around them than I'm around the humans as a police officer, because as you've seen in the past, you know, just with crazy Joe Exotic hiring an FBI undercover guy to kill Carol Baskin. Think about that for a second. That should open up everybody's eyes in the first place. It's not whether something else happened or she did something else or they did something. No, this is what happened. This is the truth. You may speculate about other things. This is the truth. He was going to kill her. He flew to Florida to make sure this guy took care of business. That is what we're up against. And there's a whole bunch. As you heard in a conservation game, Carol Baskin said it beautifully. He's just one of 30 or so. They're even more dangerous. And that's the truth. That's why a lot of groups and a lot of people will start off gangbusters and then back off because they get threatened with lawsuits. They get threatened with this. They get threatened with everything else. I'm a retired police officer. I have nothing. I drive a little bitty Encore out, out back. I have nothing. And I have the truth. So I have everything going for me. And my most my group, Carney Ann Nasser, you know, uh, uh, you guys you saw in the movie, uh, you know, uh, 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 Keith Gadd, National Park Ranger, Jeff Kramer, inter, uh, Internet. He's retired also, can, also a cancer survivor, just like me. We're all fired up. You know, Cy stepping up there doing undercover work for us. He, he was in the dark side, too. It's one of those situations. We, are, got, we have a heart and we have morals. And we're going to fight to the death to make sure this we're going to protect the endangered species in the United States of America. Like Jeff said, again, one of his favorite quotes, how does it take so long hard for us to protect or find out where endangered species are in the United States of America? I went face to face with uh, with Boone Smith, supposed to be the top dog for National Geographic. Mike left it out of the film, but I got a little smart alecky with him. I said, wait a minute. Should we start putting those rings? I just watched one of his shows. On TV, and he just talked about it on a Jimmy Kimmel show or something, where they put these little rings on the snow leopards' necks so they can follow them with telemetry. I looked him right in the face. And I said, "Hey, hey, hey! Maybe we ought to start doing that to these cats on your lap, so we can find out where they're going." And he, that was when he finished his conversation. He was done with me, but I wasn't yeah. done with him, as you can see. I, I mean, I'm absolutely staggered by the extent of it. And I think I didn't really realize how how bad it was until I, I did watch this documentary. And we've had a few people asking um, how they can watch it from various countries. We had someone from the UK, for example. How, how can they watch it back home? It's still, it's in the process. I think, I'm, 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 I don't know for sure. You can follow theconservationgame.com. It'll pop up. And Cargo is the distributor. And they're doing a fantastic job. Uh, Australia, they're already watching it. Denmark, they're already watching it. UK is coming up here in the next couple of months. Uh, I mean, all over Europe, I think, is coming up in the next couple of months. And it looks like Canada, uh, uh, South America, some of the other countries are falling in within before June or in the summer. So it's coming. It's you got to remember this only. It's it's been out for. It came in in 2021 at the end, but it's kind of um, it's it's kind of new, and it's also very explosive. Uh, as you know, and as you know, there's a lot of powerful people that the very powerful people, the ones you have to worry about, that look down on what's going on, that wants to keep that money coming in, that wants to keep the views, that wants the likes on the TikToks, that wants all this stuff, that are going to prevent that from playing in some places. So we have to go around and go through the back door, which we're working on right now for hopefully uh, some of the other countries. So with the with the big cats, I'm uh, kind of looking at them specifically at the minute, but they can't be released ever back into the wild. But if they, you have animals that are living a terrible life in these backyard zoos or, and whatever, where can they go and how can we make sure that they have a decent life after what we've put them through? Great question. That's the number one question I get all over the world. What can we do with them after we rescue them? We have a, a, a big cat. Sanctuary Alliance, a group that has come together and they have, I don't know, 20, 25 sanctuaries that are all over the uh, United States of America and they're starting to reach out. Uh, GFAS is another organization for sanctuaries that could credit sanctuaries. No breeding, no pay to play, no interaction with animals. 
the respected, the retirement communities. And there's places for them to go. There's primate rescues. There's uh, uh, lots of reptile rescues popping up now. Phoenix Herpological Society is one of them that's done some really good work I've worked with in the past. We are really touching base now. You would have asked me that 12 years ago, as you saw in the elephant in the living room, there was zero. <laughs> I mean, and there's nobody to trust. There's nobody to trust because I've actually, and this is not an exaggeration, I rescued the same tiger three times one time within a year and a half in my state of Ohio because we got it. We gave it to another group that was supposedly supposed to take care of it. They resold it. And then I ran into it again because, you know, as you see now with the, uh, the, the face uh, the stripes on their faces are just like fingerprints. The reason I figured it out because the cut across the nose because the past owner, a lot of these guys train them by hitting them with softball bats. That's why we do a lot of surgeries on them in the back, people's backyards because of their teeth get damaged, their face gets cr uh, fractures from the training. That's how they train them. And then they chain them up and the people come up, get their picture taken. But that's that's the sadness part of it. But the happy part of it is there is places for them to go. You know, I, I can't go through the whole list of them, but I've worked with some great people over the years, you know, that are ready to step up and help. And it's just I teach a, what they call a unified command where everybody gets together, everybody from Uber drivers to, to police chiefs, to everybody to play well during a natural man-made disaster. So we don't have the miscommunications and stuff we've had at other disasters. So everybody's working well together, grocery store chains, everybody. We're doing that in the animal industry now, which is unbelievably working. It's, it, these people, you've got to talk about people who've got passion and got the ability to step up. That's the group. That's the people that we got. So I think it's we got a good future. We got to stop the breeding, though. Yeah. And then once we stop the breeding, then we'll have, a, we'll have control. Just keep, put your finger in the, you know, there's sort of the stop the stop the flow. Hundred percent agree. And we got a question coming through from Jason. Hi, Jason. Nice to see you. And he's saying a lot of people are saying that sanctuaries are um, they need to be scrutinised. So you make sure that they are legit. And I think, as you said there, one of the key things to do is to look to make sure that they're not breeding animals because if you're breeding, you're just perpetuating back into the system. And these animals are going to continue to live a life of captivity. Um, okay, so I only have one more question left for you, Tim. And I like to end things on a bit of a positive note. So I'd like to ask you what your hopes are for the future and what your favorite success story is. My favorite success story, I have to say straight up front, was running into the, the team that I'm working with right now. That's my success story. We've been doing it for 10 years. Uh, I can't say enough about Carney and Nasser. She, uh, we've been to Las Vegas together. We've been all over. It's, and she's a knockout artist. She's, she's unbelievable. She's an attorney. She was at Michigan State University, as you saw on the film. She's doing work with Harvard. Uh, running some beautiful people out there. Keith Gadd, as you saw on the film. Everybody in the film, Jeff Kramer, can't say enough about him. We're a small group with a lot of friends, which makes it very cool. Mike Weber, the, the artist, the man, put this all together. That's my favorite. That's my I favorite think, story. Putting the right people in the right place. How's that? <laughs> well, I think what you've done is awesome. I mean, it's. I thought I knew quite a lot about um, the situation with animals and conservation, and and that. And your documentaries have actually took it to another level. So again, please, people, do watch them. It's a completely eye-opening experience. And what I also love is the fact that you've kind of done a bit of a 180 from going to having these animals to now being like no this is like not the correct way to be doing these are wild animals they shouldn't ever be um be put in front of cameras and lights and people screaming and shouting and that kind of thing so thank you so much tim for the work that you're doing and thank you so much for coming on the show um is there anything that you'd like to say before we say goodbye yeah, I want to thank you for allowing me to come on here and, and stand on my soapbox for a little bit. Also, if you want to help out Outreach for Animals. Now, people can donate if they want to, but I also have just written a, a new book. Uh, let me see if I put it on there. Tim Harrison. It's uh, White Magic. And this book is the true story about white tigers. None's been written before. It's all been puff pieces. This tells you the history of the white tiger in the United States of America. You get it on Amazon. But it's funny because the word white magic I learned from the bad guys. Because when they bring out an orange tiger cub, they yeah, got a nice crowd. One of the bad guys told me one time when I was undercover, wait till we bring out white magic. When they brought out white magic, it tripled. 
So this poor animal is the most misunderstood animal, and that's Nora on the front. It's Karen Agner's cover, National Geographic. She took that picture of a cat, Nora, my favorite tiger of all times, white tiger. She she was a rescue, and uh, Denise and Jose Flores rescued her from a, a very evil man in Ohio. And we were able to locate her up at the Wildcat Ridge with Cheryl Tuller and Mike Tuller up in uh, near Portland, Oregon. So beautiful animal, beautiful animals. Yes, they are, but most abused I've ever seen in my life as a white tiger. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, so again, thank you so much. We've had some absolutely lovely comments while we've been talking. And uh, thank you everyone back home for your support. We really appreciate it. The more people that see it, the better awareness we can create. So please do give it a like, comment and share. And hopefully more people can be aware of what is happening and trying to stop this practice. Tim, thank you again for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, back home for watching and enjoy the rest of your day. Absolutely.